It's now my great honor to introduce the leaders of our Oregon legislature. Last November, for the first time in history, voters elected 30 Republicans and 30 Democrats, evenly dividing the House of Representatives. That uh, is an unprecedented affair, and let me tell you uh, that they, they, uh, they pulled that off with, uh, with aplomb. Many foresaw partisan gridlock, but fortunately, the 60 members of the House wisely selected two outstanding leaders to be their co-speakers. Both come from the southwest corner of the state. Republican Bruce Hanna and Democrat Arne Roblin proved to be extraordinary leaders. Meanwhile, in the Senate, Peter Courtney was re-elected to an unprecedented fourth term as president, and he did something extraordinary, too. Even with a Democratic majority, he chose to appoint equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats to key committees, and even appointed four Republicans as committee chairs. Far from gridlock, because of these leaders, this last session was amongst the most productive in years. Even in the face of declining revenue, the legislature balanced the budget with new investments in early childhood and innovation and transportation, they, they adopted substantial reforms in health care and education. They even agreed on redistricting. In a nation marked by bitter partisanship, Oregon stands out as a beacon of bipartisan problem solving. We've asked Malia Wasson, chair of the Oregon Business Council, to moderate a discussion with these outstanding leaders. Let's hear how they made things happen and what their plans are for the years ahead. Please welcome, along with Malia, my friend, President, President Peter Courtney, and House co-speakers Bruce, Hannah, and Arnie Roblin. Thank you. Well <clears throat> We want to see you get in that chair, Peter. <laughs> you notice I'm not sitting in one. What the hip? Got me so before we get started, I, I just, hate you. See? You okay now? Okay, before we get started, I just want to point out, this is the only panel that Pat Wrighton is not moderating. <laughs> so there is a little causal relationship between what President Courtney did to him, a uh, little uh, bit of a um, roasting of Pat Wrighton last year, so that's why I'm here. There was not a long line of people wanting to moderate this panel. So um, many people have been saying, good luck, Malia. Um, so just don't mess with me, Peter, okay? Because <laughs> the reason I got nominated is they thought I could take you, so. <laughs> because of what? <laughs> All right, so let's get started with the first question. Um, the business community and others were very pleased with the outcome of the last oh, session, as we've talked about, and that was in stark contrast to what had been going on in Washington, D.C., so tell us, first question is, what do you think the secret to that success was? And then the other part of the question is, how can we help you continue that type of collaborative problem-solving process? And we're going to start with President Courtney. No, I'll start with the <laughs> oh, speakers. Okay, fine. <laughs> Co-speaker <laughs> Roblin. I'll start on that. I think um, the first part of why it worked was the election. Uh, we end up at election night realizing it's really there's a possibility that it would be tied at 30-30. And I think reality started to set in and people started to figure out, well, what does that mean and how are we going to move forward? And one of the first things that both um, caucuses did was select a group of people to negotiate what it meant to share power in the House. And I believe that the structure that we put in place, the rules that we kind of cooperatively negotiated, up until the evening before the session started. Um, we tried to anticipate all the different times we were going to have issues that could be resolved by a process. And we worked at that because we had checked around many, many other states who have gone through this process before, including our Senate who had done it before. Um, that set us with a, a plan of action. And as it went on, uh, Bruce and I got through those negotiations, got to know each other, uh, got to trust that what we said was what we would, try, we would do. 
Um, and it was that relationship that moved through the session that worked. We also found um, a willing uh, person to help us in Senate President Courtney, who really did design um, without talking to us, I think. I don't think he talked to us, but he designed um, a process in the Senate <coughs> that would make it more possible for things to continue to work. And we had um, a governor who had been through the process before and came in deciding that he was going to be actively involved and make sure that he was accessible both to the Republican Democratic caucuses. Um, all of those things actually conspired to give us the belief we can. And, and the other thing that I think really solidified the fact that we were going to do what I believe was what Oregon wanted to do, which was get along and, and figure out how to work together, was that on that first day, uh, unanimously both Bruce and I were elected by all 60 members of the House, which in fact said, let's go try to make this work together. Okay. Well, and I think uh, Arnie brings up a number of good points. The other, the other folks I'd probably compliment is just those um, the co-chair pairs, if you will. You all know we came up with a model of, of co-chairs and in our, our bicameral committees, co-co-co-chairs. And a lot of people made fun of that at the beginning and there were a lot of naysayers. But the fact is, uh, members of the Oregon legislature really took it to heart and said, um, we heard what the people of Oregon said in terms of the election outcome and now we want to see some results from that. I think the other piece that we worked very, very hard on was Arnie mentioned the trust building among us as leaders uh, with the governor and his staff, but also that we asked those co-chair pairs and the members of those committees to say, stand in the box and erase your line. Erase any line you think you had about where you are willing to go or where you would go, and instead just focus on the information you'll be provided and see if you can get somewhere. And I, I give a lot of credit to Oregon legislators who were put in um, as, as strange partners in terms of co-chair pairs, uh, sometimes in difficult positions, and they, they persevered through that and said, we're going to get good results for Oregon. And uh, so I really do give a lot of credit to, to the things that Arnie mentioned and then our entire legislative group. It was a terrific group, and they worked quite hard. Great. Thank you. Well, I think that... Uh if you talk to any great coach or any great military leader, they'll tell you that you have to have the horses uh, to prevail, but they'll also tell you that you have to get very lucky. The Oregon legislature has 60 members of the House, it has 30 members of the Senate, and when you look at that group of men and women from throughout the state, it's loaded with talent, it's loaded with thinkers, it's loaded with uh, great personalities and character, but it's very much driven by individuals and personalities. And, of course, that's not unlike any team or any organization or any business or a family. And you have to get lucky. And I, I remember thinking uh, before the House, I didn't know when the House was going to get organized. Right after we got elected, I don't know where the thought occurred to me because I'm not a very bright person. It takes me a long while to come to conclusion. But it occurred to me that in 2003 when the Senate was tied and I, without any notice, was made in the second day of the Senate president with, how, with only an hour's notice, that at the time... Uh, and I want to be very respectful here and very careful, but the House, I'm not sure, ever really adjusted to the Senate being 15-50. Uh, it never adjusted to that. And then I said, so here you are, Peter, the House is now 30-30. And I remember telling the Senate Democrats we met, we were organizing, and then many others, the other senators, we have to adjust to their being tied. If we don't make that adjustment, then this thing will be a dismal failure. We cannot always think just like we're 16, 14. And I had learned that the hard way from being a presiding officer when the Senate was tied, and I'm not sure that the House, and I want to be careful because we did get along to some extent, although that session went longer than any session in Oregon's history. Uh, you, you, you have to understand the magnitude. You may be numerically in the majority in one chamber, but at that other chamber, is a, your bicameral legislature is tied, you better pay more attention to that other chamber when you're organizing your chamber. And that just came because I'm very old, uh, I've been around too long, and I had been on Omaha Beach first wave type of thing. In other words, I'd been there. The next thing is, it's interesting when you talk about these two guys, and uh, I don't know them all that well, but it's fascinating. Arnie Roblin was the longtime principal of Marshfield High School. It's one of the great high schools in the state, athletically and academically. But think about that. He's the principal of a high school. Think about the magnitude of that responsibility. I think it's, it's impossible to be in the world of education, especially K through 12. That's my humble opinion. 
And I remember one day telling him something. I was down there, and I, my wife and I were down there. I'd never been to Marshfield. I was fascinated because I wanted to go meet Prefontaine's parents, just walk into their home, which I did, some other things. I'm fascinated by that world. And my wife and I, as we parked the car outside of Marshfield, we found ammunition, live ammunition in the parking lot. Now, I don't have guns. You don't want me to have a gun. And... Uh, <laughs> Now, now, listen, NRA, I'm not into gun control. Jenny Burdick's out there. I'm not, this is, don't go, go crazy on me. I'm not doing anything here. I have no hidden agenda. Don't go nuts. Anyways, live ammunition. So I didn't know what to do with it. I mean, there it is. It's outside a pickup truck. And uh, that, later that night, I was at an event with the principal. And I said, listen, I got to tell you something. Come over here. There's something very serious here. You gotta, I got to talk to you. Oh, my word. Darn, I got to talk to you. Listen, there's, there's bullets on your parking lot. And he says, oh, Yeah. So, or something like that, he wasn't even affected by it. Now, before you go crazy and run out of here and say that all Marshfield High School is armed, the fact is that he was very cool. Because first of all, it's a way of life down there, and I won't go into that, he can talk about that later. But he was very, very cool, and I was taken by that. But then you got this guy next to me, which, you know, he comes from, I believe it's, uh, and I had the research, and nobody will talk to us down there. I think they think we were trying to get opposition research on Bruce Hanna. Bruce Hanna, if you didn't know it, is an extraordinary athlete. All you have to do is ask him. <laughs> and uh, back on November 25th, 1977, I love to find these things out, at Parker Stadium. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's no longer Parker Stadium. I'm not even sure it's right. It's, that's the big football stadium down at Oregon State. There was a state final championship game between South Umpqua High School and a, the Tillamook Cheesemakers. And South Humqua, unfortunately, destroyed the poor Tillamook group. It wasn't even close, 35 to 7. And he was the big star. He is a big star. He'd also been in state championship games and in basketball. He's a multiple athlete. And so all of, uh, I think all of his Myrtle Creek, Myrtle Creek was out watching you that day. Now, just think about it. If I was in an athletic contest, nobody would come see me. But his whole town shows up. And that's the kind of, you, you have here, an individual who is studly competitive and a person here who is silently competitive. And their personality is beautiful. They have the perfect ego. Uh, they have the perfect, their egos. At no time did either one of them think they had to show the other one up. That came to me halfway through. At no time did either one of them think that. And so there was a magic. There is a chemistry. And when you combine that with like on my side, Senator Ted Ferrioli, who was the Republican leader, Senator Diane Rosenbaum, because they had to stand and deliver. When you look at the chairs of committees, they had to stand and deliver. It was totally a team effort. I don't, think it'll, I don't know if it'll ever be written again in Oregon's history. I'm terrified going into February. Somehow or other, we had the horses, there was the chemistry, and you had individuals, when it came to their ego, they checked it at the door. Thank God there was a point in there. <laughs> Okay, I was a little worried about my moderating skills here. Um, so our next question is, um, <laughs> what can Oregonians expect uh, to see occur in the 2012 session? Is it going to be primarily focused on the budget, or will there po be policy, significant policy work done? What is your sense of the next session? Well, let, let me start on this one. First of all, it's, uh, it's historical. It's our... Uh, first annual session beyond practice or illegal session or whatever else you want to call it that we did before. Uh, we're there for a reason. Uh, second of all, I, I think it's important to understand that because of the length of the session, uh, we have 35 days. Our goal is to finish in the 29 days of February. We've really tried to use some management st skill and style to say, let's limit the amount of legislation possible. To that end, each member has uh, has two bills and committees have five and, and even the governor thought he had four, he had five, but we got that squared away with them the other day. Um, you know, we've tried to manage the process and say, here's what we can do. We'd love to w w walk in the door and say, look, we're going to focus only on the economy and jobs and job creation. The fact is, uh, from the day we left the close of session, um, our revenue forecast is off 307 million, right in that number. Uh, the likelihood of additional reduction um, throughout the biennium is, is pretty high. In fact, when you, when you listen to the economist 
give us the numbers, it was uh, amazing to me that as we sat in the room and we're getting the sobering news that the revenue forecast is as far off as it is, uh, the guy's still smiling. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, uh, how can you be happy about this? He said, oh, I'm not happy about the number, actually, except that I'm within 1% of my projection, so <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm a statistician. <laughs> So, well, you're not going to be the one delivering the news about what we have to get done. So I think you're going to find that we will have to focus on, on readjustment uh, because of the place we're in. And beyond that, it, I'm very hopeful that then legislation with, which can move, uh, some will revolve around the issues the governor spoke of in health care and, and transformation. Uh, some will revolve around uh, the education piece. But we've got to get refocused on jobs and the economy to get Oregon back on track. Thank you. And I, and I would, I would, conc I concur with all of what Bruce just said. I think that the main issues are going to be dealing with our budget and the, some of the transformation issues and the exchange and, and finding out exactly what those are and moving forward. We also, I think, have to acknowledge that there are um, 90 members and they do each have two bills and they bring a lot of passion with themselves to those bills. And so at the same time we're doing that, we'll be doing the same thing we did before, which is talking to our committee chairs, looking at those bills. We have a, a group of, uh, one of the things that I think we learned in the previous special sessions um, was that putting us all together in short times um, in, in what we call little mini sessions has really been a productive way of getting us all together. So in January, we'll have a meeting to do that. We'll be talking about some of those bills. So you'll get to see then what the kinds of other issues are going to come forward. But I think the real issues that we will be dealing with and which will control how the session works have to do with budget and some of those big issues that the governor talked about and jobs. Well, I, uh, I'm very worried. Uh, which is nothing unusual. I came out of the womb wearing. Uh, I, uh, the, uh, when we w when we asked you and you voted to put us into annual session, I don't know if you all did or not. I think it's what 50, I don't know how many people are out there, uh, but it did pass 68 percent have having going to go to an annual session. We we consciously said we want to make it a budget session and a policy session. Now, not all states have done it. They've said maybe just a budget session. Now, the last two one of these we did, we did one in February 08 and February 10, but they were experimental tests. Now there aren't tests. This is real. It's in the Constitution. You have said you want us to meet, and we must do it. The problem is, and I'm worried about this, we're looking at 250 to 300 bills that are coming in, is I don't know how ready we are. The one thing we haven't learned yet, we're doing pretty good how to use our interim for purposes of an annual session. That is, we signed he died on the 30th of June, and we've had legislative days in September, we had legislative days in November, we're gonna have legislative days yeah. in January where the legislature comes together and meets in its committees. And we're still trying to figure out how to do that when no other legislature's ever done it, this time to get ready for February. So it's totally new. How many of those 250, 300 bills are gonna pass? I don't know. There's nothing huge coming. Now, the governor's got some big proposals, but there's nothing gigantic because I've stopped a lot of it because I'm not going to get, I, I don't want that session to get out of control. And uh, so uh, it, it's going to be hard to tell what we do outside of dealing with the budget, but we do have a tremendous amount of work to do because of the 250 to 300 bills. And we're, we're, we're getting, we're, this legislature is one of the better ones, I think, in the nation. I think we've shown that, but we're just not new used to meeting every year the way we're going to have to meet now. So it's an experiment for us. It's an experiment for you. We'll find out how, we go, good, how good we do as freshmen. Okay. This is the last question. So <clears throat> we've talked about all the good progress that's been made, um, but there are still some very difficult uh, issues that have not had the progress or the traction. And I'm thinking my favorite topic, um, generally, our tax structure, but specifically kicker reform and the stability fund. Um, how will each of you, what strategies would you use to help the state navigate uh, through those conversations that are difficult but very necessary? I'll start on that one. My feeling is that we continue to, to, to really um, need to take advantage of the opportunity. The governor's done a really good job at bringing 
diverse groups of people together to have real conversations. And I, I think that this session is going to be what it is, and I don't think there's any time to have those real big conversations, but we need to start having those conversations. And then we need to start getting people in a room together to start really having a conversation, how do we move forward? And um, I have been impressed with the opportunities that I've had to see that happen in community things, you know, um, where we bring people together and we have a conversation about how we're going to move forward with wave energy and other kinds of things on the coast. And, and lastly, what we did with all the community conversations that we had around uh, marine reserves, all of those kinds of things in, have instructed me that the be Oregon works best when we get a group of people together who have a common goal, and that's to continue to make Oregon the best place we can make it possibly be, and get them together with open minds to have real conversations. We, we come up with simple solutions sometimes to very complex problems, and they never work. So the best way to do it is to have understand it's a complex issue and bring a lot of people and have a real complex conversation. I believe if we do that, we can benefit all of Oregon and move forward. Okay, good. And I am talking about the future, not the next yeah, session. So, Who wants to go next? Well, <clears throat> I'll take another shot at that. I, I, I've had this conversation, you know, since we've had significant change in tax policy in the state of Oregon. Um, I've spent a significant amount of time having the debate when we were, when we were working through that process and now really, really diving into the data to say, what has a change in tax policy done for Oregon? Um, until we get completely through the filing period so that you can see the end result, the final end result, it's, it's a little bit hard to say. But my feeling is that when you move your state to a position that you, in our case, is one of the higher personal income tax states, one of the highest short-term capital gain states, and then you have a conversation around business, you've got to talk about potential reform in those issues in order to keep high net worth individuals and those kind of folks investing in our state because right now our tax policy is pushing them away. And probably every business person in the room could name five or ten people they know of who have left our state with those resources. So that, that's the tax policy side that's, that's going to have to have the conversation. When you talk about what we leave on the table where there's still something to be said or reform to be had, um, you know, the, the governor has touched on this. Certainly, I've been out there having this conversation. You still have to put state spending in line with Oregon's economies or Oregon's ability of its economy to keep up with it. And from that perspective, we still have to have a really tough conversation around, around the compensation and benefit packages um, that are offered by the state because as long as we have spending that outpaces our economy's ability to keep up with it, even the tax policy isn't enough to tide that change. In other words, you could keep raising it as fast as you want nearly, but not keep up with that spending pace. So we have some difficult issues to deal with. Um, we're we've had people in the room having the conversation. And I think when you talk about kicker reform, um, you have those in the room who are, who are very willing to talk about kicker reform, but it has to include spending reform at the same time because many would argue that, that the kicker currently is the only anchor to spending. So you're going to have to have a very balanced conversation around it. I think there's a lot of people willing to uh, sit down and have the hard conversation and decide what, what does the future look like and what is the best policy. And specifically, that policy has to include how do you open up Oregon's job growth. So you all did a lot of heavy lifting in the last session, very tough issues. Why is it that matters related to tax policy, tax reform, just don't get any traction? I think it's a difficult one. I mean, I, I'll go back again. Again, I, 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 I raised my it. hand and said, look, <laughs> I'll go out there and have the, I'll have the conversation. I think what Oregonians have to do on tax policy, and, uh, and I think this is critical. Again, when this filing period is over, let's go back and talk about what happened as a result of our current tax policy. I mean, if I'm the one out there and I said, hey, look, I looked at what happened in other states where we went to the highest rate, and in those states... Uh, as much as the highest third of filers in the top bracket didn't file in that state. If that happens here, if that's, if that's the result, we've got to measure it, we've got to say it honestly, and then say, was it our goal to drive those folks away? And if it wasn't, we ought to adjust it. If we're wrong, we need to admit it and say, you know what, we needed the revenue, or we needed a way to continue to provide services to Oregon, and let's move forward. But it is a tough conversation. We just have to get in the room and close the door and say politely, 
what's going to be best for us and, and, and not make it a media frenzy. And that's one of the compliments to these gentlemen that I, that I would say. You know, we've had some tough conversations, including with the governor, and there's never been name calling or anything like that. We've just said, we're going to work hard on this issue, and we've got to keep that up. I think, I think one of the things that the governor is proposing um, with and we're all working on is this 10-year budgeting process. I think until people really understand what the issues are, it's difficult in a two-year cycle when you're elected for two years, we're structurally set up to just solve the problem for today. We're not structurally set up to solve the problem for tomorrow. And until we start looking towards tomorrow, it, it doesn't seem like it's the immediate thing that needs to be taken care of. We can take care of it next session. There's always two years later that you can do something. And I think that part of the structural way we do things makes it very difficult to have the conversation you need to have regarding those kinds of issues until you actually can see a long-term picture of where you have to go and what you have to do. And then people get more creative with coming up with the solutions about how to do that. Because that's when you have a real conversation. In a two-year cycle, you're never going to mm -hmm. get the impetus with those people. Because like we've talked about, a third of our, our group turns over every time. I mean, we, people talked about term limits. We don't need term limits in the state. If you look at what has happened over the time, I, we've both been in the legislature. We talked about it. There's a group of people who have never been in the, who became into the majority, because when we did, who had never been in the minority. There's another group that have never been in the majority in their party when they were in the majority for a long period of time in the House. So because of that rapid change, people come in with a, a view about what they're going to do, and there's a whole lot of education that needs to take place about just that budget, not about where we're at for the whole year. So Good I think point. that's a part of the structure. Is that thing how much time I got? Is that what's going on down there? You get the last word, President I got one Courtney. minute. They both spoke for 10 minutes. You've I got one minute. No, uh, you can take as much time as you want. Well, I, I, all right. Uh, all I'm going to say is I, uh, I just don't think the key people want it that badly. I don't think necessarily this organization or the unions want it that badly. Uh, at 68 years of age, I've been around enough, and I've watched this great state. You've got to want it. You've got to taste it. And when you tell me, I mean, Senator Burdick killed herself. Senator Frank Morris mm -hmm. killed themselves. They want it. Oregonian wants it, great speeches, self-righteous, it's the right thing to do, I agree with it all. But there's just not, we just don't want it that bad. We just don't want it that bad. Because if you want it that bad, then you're going to talk kicker, you're going to talk capital gains. I'm not going to, get, I'm not going to go crazy in the overall tax structure because I battled that out in 1983 and I lost my life over it where I tried to remodel the entire tax code. I learned some valuable lessons. First of all, the public's got to get with you eventually. And, uh, there, there are just not enough major organization and key players that want this that bad. I'm sorry, I know you think that it is, and I know it's part of your agenda. I don't want to insult just about everybody here. I just don't think you want it that bad. I don't think the unions want it that bad. I don't think we want it that bad. We say we do. The kicker needs to be reformed. The money should go here, here, here. I just don't think we want it that bad. And if you do, Oregon can do anything and everything. She's already shown that. Remarkable votes on blast a few ballot measures. She's done things that no other state will do on a ballot measure. Mm -hmm. uh, annual sessions, rejecting term limits. Need I go on and on? She's passed statewide tax issues. Unbelievable, some of which you hate. But you got to want it. <laughs> you got to want it. And I just don't think in the end enough of us want it, enough of us care that much. We do, but we got other cares. And with that, I got zeros. <laughs> no, you still have three seconds left. It's going up now. You've got as long as you want. All right, so we accept that challenge, President Courtney. And uh, I want to thank you gentlemen for joining us today. And uh, it's uh, a pleasure to see you up here, but I also know how well you work together. And I know there are times when you have to have difficult conversations, but uh, I think we're all going to leave this conversation feeling very confident um, that the legislature is in great hands. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that Malia Wasson, she is tough. <laughs> Thank you. All kidding aside, uh, what a tremendous set of leaders. Uh, we appreciate your efforts. We appreciate your insight.